Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for joining our lecture. <clears throat> Yanis, I think that we are good to start, if you're happy to start. Yes, thank you very much, Nata. Um, so uh, first of all, welcome everyone to the Spring into STEM lecture series. My name is Yanis Papa Constantinou. I'm the head of the Photonic Innovation Lab in the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering. And today I'm going to discuss uh, some nanotechnologies that we're developing uh, in my lab in order to improve the energy efficiency uh, of the built environment. Um, I would like to Hi, start- Yanis, just a quick one. Uh, yeah. We can't hear you. You cannot hear me. How about now? Is this better? Nafta? Okay, that's good. Yep, we can hear you now. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as I was saying, I would like to start by thanking uh, the funding bodies that have very generously sponsored the work in my lab, and particularly the European Research Council. All right, uh, a few words of uh, the motivation. Uh, so, we people, like to spend a lot of our time indoors and as a direct consequence uh, our buildings are consuming a lot of energy um, and actually uh, this trend is ascending and one of the main reasons is the demand for cooling and the demand for cooling is growing exponentially and it is now anticipated that uh, in the next decades uh, cooling will be the second largest drivers of um, electricity consumption across all sectors as well as uh, CO2 emissions. And if you think of uh, the building envelope, uh, the weakest link is actually our windows, because most of the energy that we are wasting and we're losing is leaking through our windows, about 60%. A situation that uh, uh, is exacerbated by the fact that most of our buildings are actually quite old, over 30 years. And in order to meet uh, our targets for carbon neutrality, uh, it is anticipated that over 1 billion windows will need to be replaced across Europe by 2050. So in my group, uh, we're particularly specializing in nanotechnologies. This refers to uh, very small structures on the nanometer scale in order to reduce the energy waste from windows. Now, I would like to explain uh, the types of radiation and energies and energy fluxes that are interacting with our windows. First of all, what we see on the left hand side and on the horizontal axis, you have the wavelength is the solar radiation and the solar radiation extends from the UV into the visible region. This is the response of the human eye within the visible region and it extends into the near infrared. Uh, and about 50% of the solar radiation lives in the near infrared. Now the sun is a very, is a vast source of energy and that contributes on a good day, on a sunny day above 1000 watts per square meter. Just to put this in perspective, this is equivalent to about 100 LED lamps being powered up by just one area of one meter square. Now on the other end of the spectrum here with a gray shaded line, we have um, the heat that is emitted by any body, by a black body, and the heat stretches from the mid-infrared into the long infrared. And an interesting characteristic is that the solar radiation and the heat, they do not overlap, they don't spectrally overlap. And so we can start thinking of ways to manipulating them separately. Now in my group we cover research, or our research covers both these areas as I will explain in the next slides. Now, um, it would be very interesting, and what we are working on is to develop smart windows, and basically windows whose uh, uh, performance and um, changes and adopts to the environmental conditions. Uh, an example is uh, during hot weather, the near infrared radiation could be cut out, whereas in cold weather, uh, that would be let in, and as a consequence, it would retain the building uh, hot. In order to uh, achieve this uh, characteristic, we're working with uh, thermochromic materials and particularly with vanadium dioxide. And vanadium dioxide is a special material uh, which is a thermochromic uh, material. Basically, it acquires two different states. This is the crystalline structure of vanadium dioxide. And at low temperatures, uh, it occupies the monoclinic phase. And as a consequence, um, it has very high visible transmittance 
and uh, uh, high infrared transmittance. However, as the temperature goes up, uh, its crystalline structure changes and it goes uh, and undergoes a metal to insulator transition. Now, uh, it enters the metal phase, and in this case, uh, this metal phase uh, reflects quite significantly the infrared radiation. And in this way, you can cut out this part of uh, the solar spectrum. However, we cannot just uh, start coating windows with this material because the performance would simply not be there. Uh, as well as there is a problem if you are exposing the vanadium dioxide di directly to air, then it starts oxidizing. So you need to protect it. Uh, in my group, and this is the work by Christian Sol and Johannes Schleifer, we have come up with an alternative uh, design. Basically, it's a multi-layer design. So you have the vanadium dioxide buried within very thin layers, about 100 nanometers in uh, thickness. And this 100 nanometers is uh, a characteristic length scale that we'll be talking uh, about quite a lot in this presentation. So vanadium dioxide is sandwiched between titanium dioxide and silicon uh, dioxide, basically glass. And in this way, we can control very accurately the various reflections between these uh, thin layers and as, as a consequence, uh, we have managed to very significantly improve the performance of uh, a window covered with this material. So what I'm showing here is uh, the transmission of the window as a function of uh, wavelength. And the blue line is um, at low temperature. And at low temperature, you have very high uh, transmission. Whereas, as you can see, uh, when the temperature goes up, uh, the transmission drops quite significantly. And as a matter of fact, we have managed to achieve a modulation of about 22% solar modulation and gone back to a thousand watts per square meter figure that I gave before. This corresponds to about 220 watts per square meter that we are saving. Um, and this is a view of uh, uh, how a window would look like if it was coated with uh, um, our multi-layer structure. This is the, a photograph taken uh, from our window in our office. Um, I'm moving on. Um, in my group, we are working together with a, a consortium of European partners on a special vacuum glazing. And the vacuum glazing prevents heat, heat conduction. And so it insulates uh, a window very efficiently. So now I'm moving to the uh, medium infrared part of the spectrum, basically heat. And a very big part of uh, what we do with this consortium is a large scale implementation. And what you see here is this special type of vacuum glazing being installed uh, in a school uh, in Poland, as well as a public uh, library uh, in Italy. And we have fully sensorized these rooms. And in the next six months, we will be monitoring um, the temperature and other environmental conditions and see how much energy saving we can achieve with this uh, technology. Now, so far, I have talked about windows that can regulate the solar heat gain. Basically, they can regulate the part of the mean different radiation that passes through as well as they can very efficiently uh, insulate themselves and uh, prevent heat conduction. But in my group, we are seeking uh, multifunctionality. Uh, and in order to achieve this, we draw inspiration from, uh, uh, from nature and the uh, many biological nanostructures. So for example, uh, the lotus leaf is very famous uh, for its self-cleaning effect, the way that interacts with, uh, um, with fluids, with water. Uh, and uh, its super hydrophobic properties. Um, equally, uh, moth eyes, they have a, a, a nanostructure um, on their eyes that almost completely suppresses reflection. So we can start talking about uh, surfaces, uh, anti-glaring surfaces. And there are a lot of uh, other biological systems, like for example, the wings of uh, uh, the cicada uh, or the skin of the gecko uh, and the shark uh, that are very well known for their antimicrobial and, and antifouling properties. So in my group, we have spent the last five or so years uh, replicating these structures, and uh, we have made stri uh, strides in this area. By the way, uh, if you notice the scale bar here, this is all SEM images of structures we have made in the group. They're all in the order of 100 nanometers, uh, as I mentioned previously. Uh, so there's a common theme here. Uh, so this is uh, some uh, replica of the gecko skin that we have made, uh, and we have uh, uh, um, structured windows and glass in this case. But we're also working with other technologically important materials, like, for example, silicon. 90% of the world's solar cell is made of silicon. Or polymer, the most uh, abundant uh, man-made material. 
To give you an example, uh, Martina Mikalska, Tao Li, and Sophia Laney have come up with a very simple process of how to nanostructure glass and create these nanocones. This is basically a simple two-step process. And this is the top view of uh, these uh, Mothai structures. Um, the pits is about 100 nanometers and the height is about 400 nanometers or so. And if you decorate glass in this way, you almost uh, completely suppre uh, suppress reflection. So with the green line here, we saw the transmission of a flat piece of glass, whereas uh, the blue line corresponds to the transmission of the decorated glass. You can see there's about four or five percent, so our glass uh, almost completely um, suppresses reflections. And of course, you may appreciate it uh, if you try to write an email, uh, you know, outside. You can see how much glare is affecting your mobile phone screens. Uh, and these uh, anti-reflection properties actually are sustained for a very large. Um, range of angles up to about 16, 70 uh, degrees. So this is really broadband. And in addition to that, we have managed to impart some self-cleaning or super hydrophobic properties. So we are emulated water here and rain. Uh, and you can see that as the water droplets hitting the substrate, this is the substrate with the nanocones, uh, it just bounces away. And it also picks up any dust and contamination. This is the self-cleaning effect. And you you can see on the, this side here uh, the stark difference of what happens when uh, water uh, hits a flat piece of glass without the nanocones. Uh, now, uh, with the rational design, you can actually uh, introduce some antibacterial uh, properties onto this glass. And we have uh, designed specific nanocones that can kill, uh, and this is the first demonstration ever. Uh, gram-positive bacteria, this is bacteria that have very hard shell and it's really difficult to, uh, you know, to get rid of. Uh, and the way you do that is really a, a mechanical killing a mecha uh, because these nanocones are rupturing through uh, the cell of these bacteria. Um, and in, not only that, but you can have surfaces that can resist condensation of water. Uh, in this experiment, we have taken the substrates, uh, the temperature of the substrate uh, to about zero degrees um, or slightly above the zero degrees. And we have started observing how water condenses uh, from the atmosphere. And the first thing to notice is um, that uh, the water starts forming micro droplets. And these micro droplets are uh, nearly perfectly spherical and they live at the top of the substrate. I'm going to show a video here, and I would like you to pay attention to C, which is uh, one of the uh, most efficient uh, surfaces that we have made. Now, what you see in this video is um, the water nuclei. The water starts nucleating, uh, and it starts growing in size. This is what you see here with these uh, bubbles. Uh, until they grow to a critical radii, and what appears to be as uh, bursting of the bubbles, it's actually these water droplets uh, acquire enough momentum to just eject from the uh, substrate. And you have a very uh, efficient way of preventing water being condensing. And we have done this experiment over many hours and we can still uh, not see much condensation. So most of the surface is not covered with water. Three minutes, remember. Three minutes, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I will actually conclude with this slide. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, I talk about how to uh, regulate the solar heat gain through the window and separately uh, how you can uh, um, uh, impose and introduce some anti-reflective properties, uh, super hydrophobic properties, antibacterial and condensation and so on. So the last piece of the puzzle that we are working on uh, in my group is putting everything together and essentially we will start uh, or we have already started uh, coating these nanocones with a very thin layer of vanadium dioxide in order to create the first truly multifunctional smart glazing. So on this note, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take your questions. Nafta Mushomi, if uh, you can please. Hello, Yanis. Yes, so I'm... Hi, if you all can hear me. I, we are now going to start with questions. So very quickly, the first question was whether there will be a recording available. Yes, there will be, and I will send it around once it is. So moving on to the ones for you, Yanis. Um, first question, in terms of implementation, 
Would you change old window panes and replace with an entirely new glass? Or is there a way to make a coating that could use, that could just be added to the existing window? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, uh, due to uh, time restriction, I only discussed, uh, uh, you know, this type of, this new type of glazing, but uh, in parallel, uh, and if you remember in one of the previous slides, I talked about uh, introducing this structure in polymers. So we are also working in polymer films that uh, you can just, uh, you know, retrofit existing windows uh, with uh, in a kind of do-it-yourself type of uh, technology. Um, so yes, we are working on both these options. Okay, next question. Oh, a compliment for you, Yanni. Such awesome work. What is the main driver of the degradation, physical or chemical, on these nanostructures? Uh, of the nanostructures, so the nanostructures are made of glass, so uh, they're as chemically inert as glasses, so uh, there is no degradation over time, uh, if you want. Uh, however, uh, the main weakness is mechanical. Um, so uh, there are ways of protecting them, uh, but you can, uh, uh, for example, if you think of a car uh, and, and the wipers of the car, uh, you know, uh, over uh, a long time of usage, uh, you can start seeing uh, scratches and you can start seeing uh, some of these nanocones uh, being mechanically fractured. Uh, but as I said, we are also developing some technologies of how to protect these structures, uh, which I haven't presented. Uh, but mechanical, uh, the mechanical weakness, I think it's uh, uh, the number one issue that anyone working in this area uh, is thinking of addressing. Uh, the main focus of uh, the whole research area, uh, the whole research field is uh, this right now. And so it's a spot on question. Next question. How much better is the vanadium oxide coating than the double glass windows? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, again, that's a very nice question. Uh, there is no competition, by the way. Uh, so if you think of a double glass uh, window, uh, what a double glass window does, or a triple glass, uh, is try to prevent heat conduction. Uh, it doesn't do anything with uh, uh, solar radiation. Uh, so there is actually direct compatibility. We've been talking to companies, to glazing companies, uh, and the idea is to introduce vanadium dioxide uh, into double glazed or triple glazed glass. So um, uh, th there is a, a compatibility, the, the two technologies are complementing each other. One stops heat from, uh, you know, uh, in the winter, it stops heat from moving from inside your building to the outside, um, uh, or, the, you know, heat flux falling the opposite way in the summer. So having heat going from outside into your building uh, in the summer. Whereas uh, vanadium dioxide, what it does, it modulates the amount of solar radiation that comes in and out. Excellent, thank you. Next question. Could you tell me how difficult to produce these glass? I wonder which is bigger, energy saved by this technology or energy should be consumed by producing this cutting edge glass? Yes. Uh, so again, this is uh, an excellent question. So uh, I did I did mention uh, in my talk that uh, um, we have put a lot of effort into uh, developing what we call a two-step process uh, in order to edge glass. So by the way, uh, compared with uh, uh, semiconductors, like for example, silicon glass is a very hard material to edge, particularly if you want to edge it uh, uh, accurately and uh, with the precision that we're looking for. Uh, so we had a breakthrough um, with this two-step method. Uh, by cutting down on steps, we're cutting down on the amount of energy uh, that you're using, but as well as, uh, very importantly, uh, it's not only the energy that it takes you in order to uh, generate the structure, but it, it's also the yield. So for example, uh, in a multi-step process, uh, only about 50% or 60% of what you're making comes out with uh, uh, the desired properties. Uh, whereas if you have smaller steps or fewer steps, then you can improve the yield uh, to about 80, 90%. So uh, you have less waste. Uh, now, I'm not gonna give a number on the energy that we're using and consuming in order to make this glass for a number of reasons. Uh, most, uh, um, most importantly, because 
uh, as a university, uh, we work with uh, small scale prototypes. Uh, and when you go to uh, large scale, uh, you know, fabrication, then the numbers are completely different. Um, obviously, uh, the payback time is very important and you expect that in the lifetime of a glass, uh, in about 30 or 40 years, the, uh, you will have a lot uh, uh, more to gain than to lose. Thank you. Next question. When will smart glazing first be seen in the commercial sphere, i.e. when will the smart glazing windows be ready to be purchased? Yeah, so um, it depends on what people call smart glazing. Uh, there are already smart products in the market. So there is already, uh, Pilkington has commercialized antibacterial glass, for example. Uh, they have also commercialized the world's first uh, uh, self-cleaning glass. Uh, now, uh, the type of glass that we are working on, uh, which is what we call a multifunctional, well, it starts combining all these properties. Um, what we need to do, there are two steps that we need to resolve uh, in order to talk, start talking about, you know, uh, commercialization. The first one is uh, starting putting the structure of, uh, you know, many meters square. Uh, up until now, we have uh, the, the, the biggest size we have done is six inches, uh, which is quite large and, uh, you know, for pre-industrial standards. Uh, uh, and uh, the second one is to make sure that whatever process we're using is compatible with industrial processes. Now, if you start talking to uh, the glass companies, they, they, they're talking about float line glass. Uh, and what they do not like, even though they have a technology which is nice, what they do not like is disrupt uh, the production line. Uh, so we, we are working with the glass manufacturers in order to improve the compatibility of our processes with their float glass uh, uh, line processes in order to uh, get to this stage. So we are, I think we're about a few years, maybe three or four years, I would say, uh, at least, if not more. And next question, how does the material used influence the waves allowed through the window? Um, so in after how the materials used influences the? Waves allowed through the window. The waves? Yeah, W-A-V-E-S. Okay, waves. the waves, right, okay, the electromagnetic waves. Um, so uh, again, if I go back, since we have the slides. All right. So this is the key. So basically solar radiation, of course, electromagnetic wave, um, it stretches, as I said, from the UV into the visible and in the near infrared. So what vanadium dioxide does is modulating particularly the amount of near infrared radiation that can uh, enter a building. So uh, when it's in its cold state, it lets most of the near infrared radiation through but in its hot state, it suppresses transmission of near and near infrared radiation. So if you are thinking in terms of, uh, I don't know, electromagnetic waves, in terms of mobile phone signals and uh, 5G and so on, uh, in, in the hot state, it would be, I guess, quite reflective to these wavelengths, but uh, it's only an assumption. It's not something that has concerned us. Okay, next question. If the properties depend on the molecular structure of the glass surface, is it possible to implement multiple features on the same side of the glass? Uh, on the same side of the glass? Yes, it is absolutely possible. So the last, um, well, the last piece of work that we are doing right now, as I mentioned, is putting everything together. This is gonna be on the outer face on the outer side of the glass. Um, so you can have this uh, multifunctionality, you can uh, regulate the amount of solar radiation that comes through, you can have antibacterial properties, uh, self-cleaning properties and so on. So this is uh, the idea here. Uh, so that everything will go on the same side. I mean, if you would like to separate sides for any reason, then that's possible. And we have examined this, uh, um, this option as well, particularly uh, in order to protect the vanadium dioxide, where we put the vanadium dioxide on the inner side of uh, uh, the glass, whereas we leave 
the nanostructure on the other side. So that's also a possibility. It's not as efficient as coding it directly for a number of reasons, uh, particularly due to the uh, increased surface that you get by coding these nanostructures, but it would still be a good solution. Next question. Um, very curious about what materials you used for anti-condensation glass. Just glass. Uh, the one thing that you need to do uh, is uh, you need to change the surface properties. Uh, so basically, uh, you need to introduce uh, a hydrophobic coating on the glass because uh, you know the way thermodynamics work is uh, if you start with a surface that is hydrophilic, which is a, a glass in its natural state, and you start introducing some nanostructure, then it will become super hydrophilic. Uh, but if you start with a surface that is hydrophobic and you start nanostructuring, then uh, most likely you will end up having something which is super hydrophobic. Uh, and the whole idea of the anti-condensation glass, okay, so the whole idea is you have these nanocons and the way that water nucleates, it starts from the bottom. Uh, and because of the nanocons and the, uh, you know, and the slanted uh, um, structure that you're having there, the Laplace pressure, uh, it starts pushing uh, this water nuclei towards the top. And this is where they stay uh, and they take this uh, nearly spherical uh, surface. If the glass was hydrophilic or super hydrophilic, then it would just uh, wet the whole surface. This is what we, we don't want to happen. And this is why uh, in this case, we have fluorinated the glass. Okay, great. Next question. Um, Yanis, you have approximately 15 questions outstanding. Are you okay to continue? Okay, wow. <laughs> uh, no pressure. <laughs> um, right, next question. What's the cost of production? Is it practical for large scale implementation? Yeah, um, again, a very good question. So um, to, this, uh, to this extent, we are working with the glass manufacturers. Um, and they're the ones who are guiding us as far as, you know, whether this is a, um, a technology that uh, can be made in a um, in a cost-effective way because the uh, you know uh, the, the the scales you know the cost uh, scales change completely completely when you go from a, uh, a small scale demonstration to large scale production. Um, so uh, so far we have spoken to three or four glass manufacturers and the fabrication cost does not seem to be the main barrier. Uh, there are other barriers. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, integrating uh, whatever process we follow into the main um, flowed glass line is one of the key, uh, you know, uh, problems that we need to uh, to solve. Uh, as well as there are some issues, uh, for example, with durability and so on. But uh, um, uh, we think that with uh, economies of scale, uh, based on the conversations we had, this is absolutely possible. Thank you. Next question. Would it be more expensive to produce the multifunctional glass compared to flat glass? Uh, compared to, sorry, what glass? Flat glass, F-L-A-T. Yeah, flat glass. So uh, what would be, if I understand the question, what is the extra cost? Is that yes, the... yes. What would be more expensive? Oh, obviously it would be the nanostructural glass. Um, to, so it, obviously the nanostructure glass, because you have an additional step of uh, uh, creating the nanostructure compared to flat glass. Um, but again, as I said, there is a lot of interest um, no, for niche applications. If you think, for example, hospitals uh, and high touch surfaces, like for example, you go into your GP uh, and how do you, uh, you know, register yourself? There is a, a touch screen. And this touch screen, you know, there's so many interaction with so many people, uh, or uh, you know, the glass, uh, the windows of trains, or um, how many people are touching these. So there is a lot of demand for this type of products, uh, and people uh, are willing to pay this extra amount uh, in order to have this multifunctionality. Um, so we don't see the the final cost uh as being the you know it is always a barrier cost is always a barrier but uh, uh what we see from uh, the conversation that we have with uh, uh industrial partners is there is a lot of appetite with uh, uh 
uh, you know, for this type of niche, uh, high value products. Okay, next question. So continuing with the cost element, um, is this something that will be potentially available for everyone in the future? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, well, that's, that's uh, our aspiration. Uh, again, I cannot directly answer the question uh, and apologize. I'm not trying to dodge the question. Uh, it's just because I simply do not have the numbers. Uh, so the aspiration um, is to make this available to everyone. Uh, and for me, uh, this was the motivation for uh, working in plastics. Um, so I did mention again that in, in addition to uh, decorating glass and nanostructuring glass, uh, we are imprinting uh, the structures in polymer. So basically there is a process that's called a roll-to-roll -roll process. And when you start talking about roll-to-roll -roll processes, the process by which uh, every structure in your mobile phones and uh, 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 for the backlights of your mobile phones or your computer screens is made of. So there are hundreds of thousands of uh, kilometer squares being made every year uh, with this process. And for me, this is what will unlock actually, uh, you know, the possibility of everyone using it. Next question, please. How economically sustainable is the mass implementation of these windows? Um, so, okay, that's, I'll, I'll answer the same question in a different way. Uh, so uh, I'm preparing a new project right now. Um, so if you think of um, how research evolves, uh, you start by having one idea. Um, and initially, especially with this type of research, um, you start from a very low TRL, as we call it. Uh, so it's the research level by which you start with the idea. And then you need to generate some proof of concepts to make sure that this idea is working. Once this idea is working, you can start talking to some industrial collaborators, for example. Uh, and then as the idea matures, then you start thinking of, oh, okay, what would the price, the final price point of uh, this product be? Um, you know, how how... Uh, how many square meters or square kilometers can I make out of this product and so on. Uh, so we are now entering the phase, uh, we're now moving from the uh, pure research phase into the more development type of phase. And I'm uh, uh, putting a proposal which will, uh, a big part of which will be a life cycle analysis. Uh, it will take into account uh, the cost of the processes, uh, the cost of the materials, the raw materials, um, issues like, for example, recyclability, uh, of the materials at the end of their uh, lifetime and so on. Uh, so I hope that I will be able to answer all of these questions if this proposal is successful in the next couple of years. Next question. Thank you for a great presentation and fantastic work. How much does this reduce overheating? Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, it depends on uh, the, you know, the geographic location. Um, so I gave a number, um, you can, uh, um, you know, uh, prevent about 220 watts per square meter of glazing. So you can go around your house, you can measure how much glass, uh, what's the surface of your windows, and you can start, you know, doing the calculations yourself. But uh, uh, we have been more rigorous than that. And we have used the building energy modeling, uh, software, uh, and we have replaced, uh, you know, the windows of buildings with, uh, uh, or we have compared our technology with, uh, uh, you know, normal windows. And we have found that depending on the geographical location, again, in, uh, in the warmer places where, like, for example, Italy and Greece and so on, you can uh, reduce the energy consumption uh, for air conditioning by as much uh, as uh, even 40%. So it, uh, it's not a marginal, it's quite significant. Okay, next question. You are focusing on the glass at the moment, but what about the window frame? The window frame, okay. Uh, so I did talk briefly about, uh, you know, the project that we have uh, as part of uh, e-insulate and you can uh, have a look. Let me put this slide back up again. You can have a look at the website. Uh, so we made a, a vacuum glazing there and that was also some special frame uh, because it's very, very difficult to achieve, uh, uh, you know, uh, vacuum uh, and we develop some very special sealants and so on. Um, so um, it is, it is part of, uh, it is in our radar. It, this is not what we are directly working on, but it is 
part of our radar and this is part of what we're developing. So eventually what we would have liked to have done, it didn't happen in the time frame of this project, uh, is have this vacuum glazing with all the frames and everything that uh, we have developed in this consortium and have the multifunctional glazing on top of that. Thank you. Next question. How do smart windows compare to windows on the market currently? And have you had any feedback from the construction industry? From the construction industry, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, how does it compare? So as I mentioned, uh, smart window in um, exists in some form. So antibacterial glass is an existing product uh, uh, as well as uh, self-cleaning glass. Uh, so the feedback that we are receiving from the construction, we have uh, actually spoken uh, and we are actively collaborating with uh, a construction companies. So part of uh, two or three companies in the insulate, they are uh, construction and architecture companies as well. Uh, so one of the key, one of the other key things that we need to solve uh, in order for uh, particularly vanadium dioxide uh, to become commercially uh, viable uh, is uh, its coloration. So right now it has a, a slightly yellow team uh, and that has been another uh, barrier for the adoption of this technology. Uh, that said, there are ways of uh, fixing the color that we have been working on, uh, for example, by doping it. Uh, with, uh, um, like, for example, magnesium, uh, it starts shifting the band gap uh, and it becomes more, uh, you know, uh, green or blue. Uh, so, yes, they, they are, they are uh, construction companies is very interesting because what they tend to say about themselves is that they are very, very conservative themselves in terms of adoption of new technologies. Uh, and they always follow the lead of the architects. So what they, their advice was, uh, uh, you know, to win the hearts of the architects and then they will follow. Next question. Why do we use nanotechnologies? Why do you use nanotubes and surfaces on which to coat the VNO2 instead of just coating on flat glass? Yeah, again, that's very interesting. Uh, so, uh, if you think of, uh, uh, let me go back again. All right. So, uh, if you think of the length scale, this is the wavelength of light. And the wavelength of light is the characteristic length, if you want, of, uh, uh, of light. It's a very important property. Now, you see the visible light, for example, uh, covers from about 400 to 650 nanometers. Okay, so this is extremely extremely small. So if you want to really start manipulating light, if you really want to start, um, you know, uh, playing with the properties of light, then you really need to go down to uh, equivalent light scales. That's why the need for having 100 or so nanometer of structures, because that is really opening up the possibility of manipulating the photons in a way that improve the performance uh, of your coating. Uh, equally, uh, if you're talking about, you know, the uh, uh, wettability properties, uh, thermodynamically, it is when you go to this type of nanostructures that you can achieve the superhydrophobic effect and so have the self-cleaning properties, anti-condensation. And as it happens also, if you want to have uh, some antibacterial uh, properties, then you do need to go down to very sharp uh, uh, pillars as I've shown. There are more processes. Uh, uh, I explain it very simply in terms of, uh, you know, mechanically killing the bacteria, but there is also other processes. These very small nanopillars, for example, they bend uh, and there is a store uh, and release energy mechanism that comes into play as well. And it's only when you go down to this type of uh, uh, length scales uh, that you can start really seeing the best uh, uh, out of these uh, uh, designs and out of these coatings. Next question. Okay, this is the final question now, Yanis. Oh, good. <laughs> Would this concept work better or worse in hotter or colder climates? Yeah, that's a, again a very good question. So, um, right. So if you have very cold climates, then you're better off with a static coating. So, um, you know, uh, the glazing industry has developed static coatings for decades now, like uh, low emissivity, low coatings. And equally, if you are, uh, you know, uh, if you live in a very hot place around the world, then again, uh, 
most likely you are uh, you know better off uh, with uh, uh, a static coating. So uh, where you would use a smart window is in temperate climates uh, and in some case, cases in continental climates. And we had a, I had a PhD student actually investigating where uh, in which places in the world this uh, technology would be you know more beneficial. Uh, and we found that uh, it can benefit over 2 billion people actually, uh, where uh, you spend sufficient amount of time in both hot and cold states to justify having a smart uh, uh, technology. Okay, so that was your final question then, Yanis. So I think that we are good to wrap up now. If you I want to say a final few words. Well I, well, I would like to thank everyone for their attention and for the very interesting uh, questions. If anyone would like to follow up with an email, then uh, please do so. And thank you again. Thank you all for attending.